Thanks, guys. Um, this is a presentation that my colleague Matt Pryor gave at a uh, UK science conference um, last week. I think uh, it's it's a little bit longer than the, the lightning talk, so I'm going to blister through the first bit. Um, I think it's um, uh, the, the novelty or the interesting pieces to the audience here is probably towards the end. So we're going to we're going to um, crack on and um, go and have a look at some of the pieces at the end. So the, the what we're talking about here is a another cloud portal. Um, this one is is more focused on multi node platforms or um, uh, managing compute clusters. Um, so the the driving force behind it it was originally developed in order to service the kind of dynamic hpc environments that um, at stack hpc we have been delivering more and more and and sometimes at um, increasingly large scale uh, systems running in the in the top 500 uh, today are running these kinds of platforms and and really it serves to this idea about dynamic hpc so we have this technology stack where um, we're bringing um, tools like um, OpenStack into service as an infrastructure layer beneath Slurm and Kubernetes and other kinds of scientifically oriented compute platforms uh, in order to, to simplify the way that users are accessing science workflows. Um, so the project is actually developed, um, was originally developed by a UK meteorological uh, weather cloud uh, called Jasmine and uh, Stack HPC's team have um, uh, picked it up and adopted it and developed it a little bit further for a science federation across the UK called IRIS. The main focus of it is not to um, it is to provide self-service uh, for users, including of multi-node compute environments, uh, without imposing on those users the obligations of security and maintenance and uh, uh, learning to become effective sysadmins, because I think that would serve nobody. Uh, in a very, very reliable way. So what we provide, um, it's more, as the line at the bottom says here, it's got more than infrastructure as a service, um, but it's also more flexible. The self-service components are uh, more dynamic than a platform as a service is typically uh, provided. Um, I, will, I will skip through some of these pieces um, and I guess that there are three use cases. Uh, the first one is actually very similar to what Exosphere has been providing. It was very nicely demonstrated uh, just now. Uh, so that is this idea about being able to get research computing environments easily deployed. Uh, in many cases, a, a sort of a single node workstation environment, um, often referred to in our circles as, as moving into that transition stage from a scientist's laptop and coding on the laptop into a, um, a managed cloud infrastructure, often referred to as the bigger laptop model. So uh, the idea there is that um, a user would log into the cloud portal, simplified uh, sort of uh, take on, on Horizon, uh, but focused on this curated set of applications. And um, I think I will skip through this bit because we have seen some of this, but some of the key features here, uh, one is that we operate particularly well in environments which are short on um, external public IPv4. Uh, so there is no external IP. Everything is tunneled through a um, an application proxy, uh, which is managed through the portal. The users authenticate to the system using uh, generally using OpenID Connect um, or using the, uh, the Keystone services themselves. Um, in the OIDC case, we use the same module as Keystone. Uh, so it usually requires another uh, configuration source within the ID provider, uh, but otherwise it is um, a, a federated authenticated model where, where we don't handle the credentials for the users, they go to the IDP instead. Um, another thing here, uh, I, that writing is really tiny, I don't doubt you'll be able to see it, but in this case we're using um, uh, Designate to manage a, um, a, uh, a subdomain and we provide this um, um, auto-generated sort of um, uh, encoded application proxy endpoints uh, for users to ac access. Uh, these are authenticated through the OpenID Connect uh, session. So there is no further authentication once the user is authenticated once, uh, they can access um, in very much the same kind of experience as, uh, 
as we had with uh, Exosphere just now. So a guacamole or a desktop or a web shell. Um, I'll, I'll try and skip over this bit a little bit quicker. So the the one of the key pieces that is interesting here is the use of this Zenith application proxy, uh, which is an open source project that we have been uh, developing here at Stack HPC and is available on GitHub. Um, that is installed by invoking an Ansible playbook uh, as part of the cloud init uh, cloud config for the uh, for the service when they boot. Um, things get um, a little bit more developed when we start to look at de uh, deploying these multi-node compute pl platforms. Uh, the, the main example of this is a Slurm cluster, cluster uh, but there could be plenty of other options for deploying multi-node compute. We fill in a, a survey or questionnaire form in which the key parameters uh, for the cluster are, um, are entered. Uh, this is all done through Ansible playbooks um, on GitHub. So behind this, there is an AWX or Ansible Tower instance, uh, which checks out a, a, um, a playbook for deploying the cluster. And there's metadata within the playbook for the different parameters that are required uh, for user input. So we enter those things. Uh, the Slurm cluster uh, gets deployed. Uh, it comes to life. And I think we then get uh, these key pieces on the, the right hand side here are um, the um, the services that are exposed through the uh, the application proxy. So we get to, uh, without requiring any floating IPs on the system, uh, we get to access Prometheus dashboards or open on demand interfaces, which have been embedded within this um, uh, deployment and exposed through the application proxy, where as sort of named ports uh, that can be accessed through the user's session uh, to, to Azimuth. Um, I think probably that's um, enough to show about uh, the way that the multi-node Slurm clusters are deployed. Um, we can also see, as you, as you see here, some uh, sort of basic telemetry from uh, node exporter. Uh, we also have a Slurm um, data collector or dashboard. And, um, and so that will actually expose data about jobs running within this sort of self-serviced um, Slurm cluster platform. Uh, I'm going to skip through some of these pieces in the interests of uh, of time, uh, because what I'd really like to focus on is is the Zenith proxy, which I think is is the bit that um, uh, you guys would would like to see. Uh, so the third the third major area of um, compute compute platforms that um, as of supports is deploying a Kubernetes environment and and deploying applications uh, within that. Um, Kubernetes is deployed using cluster API. And so we get um, a, a well-supported um, upstream maintained um, OpenStack integration with, with Kubernetes uh, through cluster API. Uh, so we key in the, the, the parameters in the form as, as we did before. Um, and we can also add things like uh, uh, auto scaling so that a, a job will, will ramp up and down as required. Uh, this is also available for the Slurm cluster as well. So Slurm has some support for auto scaling. It will um, uh, increase the the number of worker nodes um, as as the queue gets longer. For the um, for the Kubernetes side, um, so one of the useful pieces that we can add is um, um, I think it's the it's the auto scaling first, or I forget. Um, so one of the useful pieces we can add is is how to to install applications in a friendly way. So we have this thing called the integrations with Cube Apps. Um, another useful piece here is for direct access to your Cube config. Um, it's easily exposed through um, through the portal, so that you can actually access the Kubernetes cluster from the command line too. I think um, the other pieces here. So. Again, uh, the Kubernetes uh, clusters have integrations back through the application proxy. Uh, so without creating any external IPs or any floating IPs for the system, um, we can access through the portal um, a, a set of pre-configured uh, services, including the applications, the third one down, which is the Cube apps. So um, as usual, we get uh, some access to monitoring dashboards and telemetry performance for the system. And then we get access to a catalog of, of 
applications which can be curated by the operators of the uh, of the cloud. Um, I think there's a little demo uh, coming up here of some of the auto scaling. Um, get access to things like Jupyter Hubs, uh, Jupyter Hub and Dask environments as well um, through uh, these pre-configured cube apps. Um, the point in, in red here, everything is um, authenticated once when we log into the portal. And then because we re retain the same session throughout, um, there is no further authentication uh, from end to end on the system. So um, quick Jupyter notebook and then I can't show you the demo, I'm afraid, uh, but we can show it's a, there's a nice demo of using Dask for, for auto scaling. Uh, who doesn't like a bit of auto scaling in a demo? Um, can't show it for you today, though. So uh, I'm not sure how I'm doing for time, but it does look like the, uh, the clock is progressing. So I better focus on the final piece, which was this um, this Zenith proxy. And, uh, and this is really the piece that has been driven through um, a lot of requirements that users have had of um, on infrastructures that we've been working with. Uh, so, for example, a shortage of IPv4 or an unwillingness to use large amounts of IPv4 for um, uh, floating IPs for large scale compute clusters, for example. A um, little bit hard to read uh, the diagram here, but uh, the way that it works is that the on each of the compute nodes, uh, they have the they are configured to dial out an SSH connection. So we create a, a reverse tunnel back into the um, uh, the Zenith application proxy uh, running in a service tenancy. So there is no um, exposure of inbound connections. It is all managed through an outbound connection, which has a, a reverse forwarding of ports. Um, I think, as it says on the line below, uh, we'll have a blog post coming on how Zenith does what it does in greater detail soon. So that's what we've been up to. Um, I think that's uh, pretty much it. Um, there's a lot of, um, of course, there's lots of other things that we may want to work on, uh, but I think time is uh, going to have to cut that short. So I think I will stop there. Thank you very much.